Gentlemen, the time has come once again to discuss things. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Geeky Gentleman Fan Project Reviews. Because I like branching out. Usually it's fan films. This week, kind of, sort of, not so much. Uh, joining me today is the one and only Real Manos, aka Justin Cristelli. Hi folks. Hi. Uh, Manos, what are we reviewing today? We are reviewing a DBZ uh, fan film, fan animation actually. Uh, I think it's... Dragon Ball R and R. Yes, that is correct. Dragon Ball R and R. So I told you a little bit about the background of this, but I'll just go over it real quick for people who are unaware. So um, Dragon Ball Z Abridged is a very popular fan run parody series. Uh, the guy that voices Goku in that is uh, named by is a uh, YouTuber named Mosco X. And he does a lot of Dragon Ball content on his own channel, including a series of videos of, like, what if this happened in the timeline? What if that happened? And one of his most popular series was what if Raditz from the first five episodes of Dragon Ball Z, instead of dying and being useless, actually became a good guy, like every other one of Goku's friends. Um, And it just became a very, very popular series uh, to the point where he decided to turn it into a fan project all its own and do this kind of audio drama manga dub thing. So it's a completely original story written by him and one other guy that he got on his team. Um, This is all original art, original voice acting, even some original score for the thing. I'm kind of addicted to the uh, opening theme song. I love it to death. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just a really, really interesting fan project based on like an idea that absolutely baffles me because i cannot imagine that there was going to be this much interest in raditz you know having any kind of character uh i don't know vanos but since you didn't really know many of much of the background or, or have much investment in the um in the the youtuber involved in all this uh, i'm curious what did you think of it generally I, speaking i really enjoyed this and it uh I, I was uh, very impressed with the animated opening. Uh, I, I kind of look at this as kind of like an elaborate um, comic dub or manga dub, manga uh, dub yeah. with uh, with some animation uh, done as best they can to make an ep- uh, an episode. And I'll be I'll be straight with you. Um, I think I like this continuity better than uh, the continuity of the regular series. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I, as a Vegeta fan, I'm gonna say I don't, but that's okay. Um, and I'll get into why. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, it's it's really interesting because by making Raditz a good guy, I mean it really does 
undercut a lot of what Vegeta has to go through to, you know, have his character arc. So I'll I'll be the first to say Vegeta's an asshole, and then he kind of begrudgingly becomes a better person. Uh, but if you kind of like, t- yeah, debatable, whatever. Uh, if if you take a lot of the the chances for growth away from him and and give them to Rad, it's yeah, he's gonna kind of still be an asshole, and that's kind of what you're getting here. Uh, so I know a lot of people like reacted to this that are Vegeta fans were like, oh my god, he's a monster. I'm like, yeah, he is. And while I get it, I still don't love it. Uh, because if it's between Vegeta and Raditz, I'm gonna choose Vegeta every day. That being said, I fucking adore Ranch. She is awesome, and I love it. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm really into this as well. This is a really really cool series, and I'm I'm curious because I got a couple of very particular criticisms about it, given that like what I know about the background. And I'm curious how much those will stand out to you. But yeah, I wanted to. Really was curious what you th- what you were going to think about this one. I really liked the the, the essential premise because this character Raditz was never given a chance, and when you could look back and think about it, like wow, he was Goku's brother. You know, he, I mean, Goku could have been him. They they suffered the same kind of like uh, abandonment and you know the abuse of like uh, Frieza destroying their culture and. Yeah, he would have been pretty easy to, if he had lived, to convert, I, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, possibly even easier than Vegeta. Oh, certainly. And, uh, and I, I feel like that's kind of what they're going for here, and why Raditz is like such a good-natured character, much more so than Vegeta ever was. Yeah, and it. what I like about... Uh, I, I, I said I like this uh, continuity better, because I actually like the... <laughs> the dynamic of the three uh, Saiyan characters and their families it's because like Goku is like a cheerful, optimistic, goopy fun guy. Uh, Vegeta is a scumbag. <laughs> and Raditz is kind of in the middle. And I really like that. Um, I, and, and yes, I do enjoy his, um, his daughter Ranch uh, a lot. Um, and I, I like what their uh, relationship does to their kids and affects their relationship. Uh, I like the the relationship between the three kids, uh, mm-hmm. Goten's, Trunks, and Ranch. Um, there's a lot of potential here. And when I see this, when I, I watched this, this this morning, actually, I was actually really kind of disappointed in the regular show for not thinking of doing this because I... I I, I watched some episodes just recently because they've been showing, um, I think it's Super mm-hmm. on uh, Adult Swim right now. It's like, uh, I really do like this better than Super. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like this this arrangement, obviously, because it's not a fully animated series. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but I, I like this character stuff. Yeah, and that's the thing that I really like about this premise because it's called R&R for Raditz and Raunch, yep. but... It's also got the the undertone, and, and he pitched it this way when he, like, announced it on his channel as, like, uh, doing a casting call for voice actors and stuff. He pitched it as rest and relaxation. This is going to be a slice of life series, and yeah, it's still going to have action, but there's not going to be a saga. There's not going to be a Frieza saga, a Boo saga in this. This is just going to be family interactions and, you know, like, fun, you know, like... I mean, really, this it feels like if mangas had a silver age is is kind of the the premise that he seems to be going with here. Just like little one and done episode adventures that maybe there's going to be kind of a continuity, but not much. It's just going to be about trying to have a fun, laid back kind of time with, you know, cool little fights here and there. Yeah. And I adore that premise for Dragon Ball. Oh, my God. I can get into that so much. Yeah. Um this might sound typical coming from me. Um, but I, I think halfway through this, or maybe even, not even, not even halfway through, um, I started thinking a lot about uh, Steven Universe with this. And uh, I know uh, they've made Steven Universe references on Dragon Ball Z Abridged in the past. Like they did a whole, uh, I just want to see you turn into a Super Saiyan, a Super yeah. Saiyan. 
Um, they did that whole thing, so I'm sure someone on that team is a Steven Universe fan, and I'm not sure if it's Masako. It's interesting because I I, I know you, didn't, you haven't watched uh, Steven Universe, but there is a lot of uh, influence Dragon Ball Z has had on Steven Universe uh, with the nature of fusion. Uh, and, you know, you know the characters have fusion powers. Uh, they even do a dance. Mm-hmm. Uh, their dance is a lot more elaborate, by the way. <laughs> um, and there's even like subtle references here and there. Uh, there's a hilarious, there's a blink and you miss it uh, reference uh, of an episode called Nightmare Hospital, where they're fighting monsters at a hospital, and on a staff sign, like you know, of, of the doctors working, is uh, at the top Doctor Jero. <laughs> um. <laughs> And, <clears throat> yeah, Fusion is definitely uh, a big influence in that show, and it's kind of neat to see, I think the way the relationships are done in that show kind of remind me of the way he's doing relationships with, with the DB, DBZ characters in this, because uh, Fusion, what's interesting about Fusion versus, uh, and Steven Universe versus uh, Dragon Ball Z is that... Um, Dragon Ball Z has only really paid attention to what Fusion does as far as, like, your power levels and your abilities uh, Mm -hmm. and working together. Doesn't really take in the fact that uh, these characters, like, literally share their bodies uh, and what it might do emotionally to them. It does not, it never even, like, bridges the subject. At least I've never seen it. I haven't seen to a, a slight extent, but not nearly the level of what you're talking about. Yeah, I'd and, say. And on um, Steven Universe, uh, that is like the lead, and you know, it's like been a metaphor for sex. It's been a metaphor for late relationships. It's been a uh, metaphor for uh, sexual abuse on the show, mm-hmm. and it's really like dealt with like w- like what it really means. And now we go to this, and I'm kind of seeing that kind of come into play uh with the the trunks and ranch um fusion and yeah that yeah and uh and how like he obviously i think had a crush on her and you know they fuse and you know uh that you know kind of like you know it, it is dealt with uh, especially at the end and mm-hmm. uh, it's like man that's i don't know i i, I can't i I don't know. I guess he has made, uh, or his crew has made references, so they've obviously seen it. So I, I, it's kind of fun to think about maybe now that's kind of like paying it back. Uh, mm-hmm. Even it all, even, it all comes full circle. All comes full circle, like because you know the Stephen and Con- Connie fusion is a male mm-hmm. female fusion, uh, and that character Stevani is like gender neutral. And, uh, you know, here we go with uh, Trunks and uh, Ranch doing that. It's like, yeah, I mean, th- th- that's all like, I, I don't know, that's like all I was thinking about, like 10 minutes into this. Yeah, I mean, it's really, really interesting to see the way this all works out. Um, I do like a lot of what they're playing with with Fusion, uh, because... Fusion, like most of the stuff in the Boo arc, is just one of those really cool ideas that they never did anything with, and it just got thrown out. Yeah. To be fair, I haven't I haven't watched Super, so I don't re- know what, what's done with it there, but still. Um, so Fusion is just like this really cool thing, and then so they're they're able here to make it really cool, but also do some really interesting character stuff where like, yeah, you've got a boy and a girl who both like each other but don't want to just come out and say it because they're they're a little too young to to be able to express those feelings um and to just see how that like kind of interaction um builds off of itself yeah i really really like that um and it's also like it's just it's cute it's adorable uh when you get right down to it that that you've got like this whole boys are better girls are better debate coming through in that way Mm -hmm. um it's just so classic kid shit you know and i really really enjoy that about it um because you know say what you will about the the boo arc and stuff i really loved the way the kids were written there trunks and goten were a lot of fun in that arc and i i did enjoy them they get it gets a little much but i still love it um whereas but now throwing Ranch in here uh, is it just adds a whole new dimension. Um, I also really like it because 
Fucking a girl goes Super Saiyan. Um, thank you. Like, God, that always bugged the shit out of me with um with Pan in GT. And I know that they they've done it with uh one of the Universe Six Saiyans in Super, but still, uh, it took you know ten years too long or whatever. Um, yeah. So just shit like that. Yay! Thank you. We got a girl who's not only is she as strong as the boys, she's also smarter than both of them, literally combined. Yeah. Uh, like she, she goes, okay, they're going to fuse and go super saiyan three right off the bat called it. Yeah. Uh, it, it's so like, she's got this level of, of insight into them. And the thing I love about this show is it's going to be focused mostly on Ranch and Raditz, oh, but yeah, in I mean, particular absolutely. on the kids, <laughs> um, in particular on the kids. And yeah. that's, that's so good. And that's one of the potentially great ideas about letting rabbit raditz live uh is like what could he have contributed to this uh the world and Mm -hmm. wow i mean it just it's just a simple it's just a simple thing one simple thing i mean the funny thing is that's pretty much all of dragon ball fan stuff i've seen as far Mm -hmm. as like out there fan projects is it there's a couple things that just kind of continue the story from the end of Z on their own before you had stuff like Super and and didn't really get into GT. Um, so there's a couple things that do that, but like one of the other fan mangas that we reviewed for this show was Dragon Ball Psy, and that's, you know, it's just like the old Marvel What Ifs. That's, what if Vegeta got sent to Earth instead of Goku? Mm-hmm. And it's a really fascinating ass character thing. There's another thing, another fan manga I want to review at some point called Dragon Ball Wrong Time. What if Trunks is time machine fucked up and he ended up in the Saiyan saga as opposed to the Android saga? Ah, that's th- like that shit's fascinating. These little alternate little timeline things and just just these little tweaks to the continuity that completely change everything. And yeah, it's, it seems like that's a really, really attractive thing for for all the fan fictiony ideas associated with Dragon Ball. Mm-hmm. Um, let me ask you this: Do you think it's it's, it's basically fan fiction? I more so than a lot of fan films. I feel this this kind of enters the realm of fan fiction because we have you know original character and and all this other dynamics that add into it. Do you think it gets a little too into kind of falling into the traps of fan fiction when you've got like the original characters able to beat Goku and Raditz fused together, or that that kind of thing, or do you think it just totally justifies itself? Uh that's hmm, that's a good question. But I don't know the the fan the fusion the fan the fan character doesn't seem to represent too much of uh, the original creators. Oh, um, of course, it's their baby and it's their debut, their first episode. Oh, um, and I don't remember the the character really beating them as far as power level is concerned. It's like sort of about fighting them. Um, or maybe they, I don't know. I, I would say no. Yeah, I, I, I could see that criticism because it like definitely entered my head, but... I don't know, it just so worked for me. Uh, like, it's it's one of those things you can get away with it as long as you can get away with it. Yeah. Um, and and I really, really did, dug dug the way it worked. Yeah, I mean, they did beat... They did beat them, like, dominated them. You know, they didn't destroy them. Um, mm-hmm. Then we'd be kind of talking fan fiction kind of level writing. Uh, mm-hmm. But no, it felt... It, to me, it felt natural and fun. Uh, I, yeah. didn't even, I didn't even think about that. Because sometimes... When I when I read or watch something that's done fanficy and it's like way too they're way too much into themselves, it, it gets annoying. And you know, yeah. uh, but that, I, I didn't even consider that when I was watching this. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Um, it it I watched this I think two times now. I'd actually had to really pace myself because. I'd been planning to pick it because a couple uh, weeks ago, since he'd been promising this for a while, they released the first half, which cuts off right where the commercial break is in this. Yeah. Um, they released the first half, just kind of like wet the palettes, and I saw that. And I was like, okay, yeah, I really want to talk about this. And then when I saw the full episode was up, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to watch it until it's time to do the review with Manos because I knew I, knew I was going to pick it. Um, I'm glad you waited because uh, I enjoyed doing the full episode. Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, it's funny, a lot of my story-based complaints are actually in the first half. <laughs> um, <laughs> but 
we'll, we'll get into it in just a second here because we've been overwhelmingly positive and there are some negatives I want to talk about and, and definitely point out. But um, I just, I really like the way that this this whole premise works. And, and to the, the point about the, the, fa- the original character being able to win, blah, 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 blah. You know, yeah, it is it is very definitely tropey of fan fiction, but at the same time, I feel it's it's smarter writing because there's this undercurrent and theme, and it kind of gets all explained at the end when they're sitting on the rooftop of yeah. Capsule Corp, and yeah. I really like that. Yeah, and it's also like when you're debuting your character, make them look good. I, I, mm-hmm. just, I don't think that's too tropey of uh, fan fiction, because um, I thought this was really solidly put together, especially that fight scene. Um mm-hmm. So, yeah, I've seen that before in, like, legitimate continuity and stuff. And I don't know. This this seemed to fit into that. Okay. Uh, one other thing I want to say is I really like uh, that they picked Launch as the character for Raditz to hook up with. Yeah. Um, Launch is one of those characters Toriyama just forgot existed. <laughs> um, I wondered that, too, because I remember uh, I got into... I was aware of Dragon Ball, and then I really got into Dragon Ball Z, of course, through a Cartoon Network, and I'd see glimpses of that character. Like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> but she's kind of, There's no, like, no word whatsoever of her. Um, yeah, he just forgot she existed. He and, just he forgot yeah, to write her. <laughs> that's great. And uh, putting her with Raditz, I think, is kind of a genius move. Oh, she I, still I, I would have been like kind of hanging out at that time mm-hmm. before disappearing with, I don't know, uh, Richie Cunningham's brother or whatever the hell she, <laughs> she did. Um, nice. nice. And, uh, yeah, that would have been an inappropriate choice, like if uh-huh. the, the real creators were doing this. Mm-hmm. So I really like uh, the use of her. I am so excited for Blonde Launch to show up. Oh, my God. I'm so hyped for when that happens. I'm hoping it's next episode. I, I was a little disappointed it didn't happen in the first episode, to be honest with you. Uh-huh. Um, but anyway, so I really like that. Um, but now I do want to get into some of the negatives here. Uh, and I'm curious how many of these are going to be apparent for you, because they stood out to me as a fan of Dragon Ball Z Abridged. Um, so the joke, I'm just saying... Uh, how did that land for you, or did it at all? Uh, it hit me as a cute pun. Okay. Because that's a line they've used a number of times throughout Dragon Ball Z Abridged. Yeah. Um, and it's, multiple characters have said it, and it's, you know, it's just ridiculous. And so, to see, like, that running gag brought in, um, to this, I was like, all right, I'll give you, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. The other thing that, like... I'm I'm worried about it becoming is I want this to really more stand just as a fan. I feel this would is stronger if it stands almost entirely on its own and doesn't have much like reference to really anything. Like I really don't want references to the mainline continuity or, or inside jokes to GT just because I feel that kind of cheapens the, um, the quality of this to a degree. Uh, I, I feel that that kind of rubbishes it. And so, you know, like seeing that in there, I was like, all right, I'll give you one. What kind of like worried me under it all is Goku's a fucking blockhead, just no matter how you slice him. Yeah. But in DBZA, Goku is like excessively blockheadish, And they're, they're not quite touching him to that level here, but it's it's got a little bit of like, I can tell that, that he's definitely got a, a strong influence from DBZA mm-hmm. as he's writing Goku in here. Like, you know, oh, maybe one day she'll be like her, her mother. Blonde? I mean, that's yes, funny. Yes, Kakarot. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's, there's no denying it's funny. For me, it's just, as a fan of DBZA, it feels a little too much like DBZA. Goku mm-hmm. creeping into the writing there is kind of what I'm getting at. Well, if these are, like, the creator's... You know, or creator from DBZA, you know, that look, that style of writing and that style of humor is, is going to be there. They can't like change how they make humor for this type of property. Um, you know, it's it's interesting you say that because I think they do quite dramatically here. Mm-hmm. Like the the well, humor in DBZA is very apparent and, and very signature. Well, yeah. Well, um, the, well, the, the humor in uh, a bridge is like strictly parody. 
Mm-hmm. Um, this is their attempt of how they would really do the show. But mm-hmm. that same level of like levity and humor for jokes and wit going back and forth, that's probably not going to be too far left of field. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's just like, so there was the way they write Goku, and then there's like, again, it's a gag that got brought up in uh, DBZ A, where everyone talked about Goku stole all their all of his attacks from other people. Um, <laughs> and like, it's a really funny point to make, but like, that they go through the whole, oh, he's just gonna steal my dad's attacks. I'm like, uh, it's just, it feels a little, it feels a little like a crutch, uh, to be honest. It feels like, hey, this is the guy that, that does Dragon Ball Z a bridge. This guy does Dragon Ball Z a bridge. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, I get it. And I'm, I'm really glad that he's branching out and doing some other stuff that's still related to the fandom. That's really great. I'm just like, I'd, I'd like to see him try to do just a really solid, uh, standalone t- take that doesn't feel like it has to reference DBZA in order to, um, justify itself. I would give him a break on that because this is the first episode, mm-hmm. and like therefore, it's really it's, interesting. Yeah, therefore you you can kind of see this as a transition from mm-hmm. uh, the parody of Bridge series to an actual attempt at a series. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this episode, maybe another couple you know, might have that kind of transitional feeling. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, if they're up to episode twenty four and they're still like actually increasing how many times they do this kind of thing then yeah that, that might be a little bit but okay yeah it, and, to me, and what's really to, interesting is the yeah. it's only in the first half yeah once you hit that commercial break a lot of that style of humor and those like wink wink nudge nudges really fade away and it just kind of maybe it's just i'm getting more engrossed in the story of the episode itself but it really just kind of stands on its own so much better by the time you get to the second half yeah, and I, I think you can even see it within the first episode. Oh, uh, um, that hey, look, we're the bridge guys. Here we go. You know, hey, we do a couple jokes, uh, but let's let's do what we really want to do. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, kind of like prepare people. I, I don't know. And to me, as a person who really hasn't watched a bridge except for uh, the one thing uh, you guys did um, a couple of weeks ago, I I'm primarily just. Uh, DBZ guy and this you know felt like a new fun DBZ series just obviously with different creators uh, Mm -hmm. that did their homework and really you know and love and are fans of the original show let me ask you this because I mentioned to you a little bit of the background because I wouldn't have wanted to throw you in absolutely cold on this I thought that would have been a little too cruel so I give you a little bit of background on this and told you that it was one of the guys involved in DBZA mm-hmm. um, were you like worried going into this because I know you weren't a huge fan of DBZA what, what little you watched yeah I'm not a big I, um, I didn't go into it like oh shit now I gotta do some homework and drudge through this um, I thought okay let's check it out uh, I okay. went into it with an open mind. All right. Um, okay, one other thing I want to make sure we address before we go off. And I actually, I set up a whole thing. I sent Manos a video. I'm going to play it right now in the thing. So, Manos, cue up your video. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, I want to talk about the way the shading of art is done it, throughout the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, and... and It's very, this is like so particular, but I do think it's going to be a big thing that needs to be addressed and and dealt with throughout the series. So I know multiple artists are working on this piece. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that that obviously leads to different styles kind of combating each other or coming up against each other. Um, And honestly, the, the character designs and the background, it all looks fine. The biggest problem... Excuse me. The biggest problem I had with this series from a technical standpoint was the shading of the still images and animation. Um, so there are two notable types of shading that happen here, and I think I got the technical names for them. I'll apologize because I'm definitely out of my comfort zone. But there's cell shading and screen tone shading. Uh, so in the video that I'm playing, you'll see a, 
uh, cell shaded Vegeta and a screen tone shaded Vegeta. And what I found interesting is these two still images I captured are both from the same scene, literally broken up only by a couple shots, a, a few seconds apart. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got the shell cell shading, which uh, has that very smooth look to it. It's a, like a single, uh, just a handful of colors that are all roughly on the same palette. Um, and then you got the screen tone shading, which has this gridded look to it, right? Yes. So you can t- you can easily distinguish what I'm talking about. Um, now, generally speaking, I just, as a thing that I like, I definitely prefer cell shading. But rather than just do something to please my sensibilities, I would say I would caution them against as much as possible using any of the screen tone shading. That's a medium, that's a, that's a way of visualizing art that works fine in print, but especially putting it on screen, and especially when you're doing these pan and, and crops and stuff and zooms on your still images, it causes a very particular problem that happens on some screens but not others, and that's called phasing. And so what you'll notice, depending on the screen you're watching this on, is when the camera pans across the screen tone shaded Vegeta, the um, lines start to blur together, and that has to do with certain screens based on how your um, computer or television or whatever uh, refreshes and and deals with pixels and movement. Um, And so when you do this cell or do this um, screen tone shading it creates this phasing thing and it just it makes it look like the image is moving and it's really trippy and just like it it just fucks with your eyes and so i'm really really going to say i i don't know what the capabilities of all these different artists they've got working on this are but if at all possible they should really try to standardized and only use cell shading or only use the screen tone shading in backgrounds or on still images only don't use it on moving images um, and I know that's like really specific, but to me that goes beyond nitpick and really can become a significant problem because of how distracting it potentially can be to the piece. Did, did you notice that at all while you were watching? I don't know what you watched this on because it's not going to be everybody's TV, everybody's laptop screen. Um, I watched this on my laptop. Sometimes I watch these videos on my TV. This one I chose to watch on my laptop. I didn't notice a specific difference. I did notice when you shoot me, the, sent me the video. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah. that's, that's only you basically pointing it out to me. I didn't catch it in the particular episode. I th- okay. And it's it's interesting because the tighter the um the screen printing the gridding and and dotting depending on what you're using the tighter the image is uh, of that the the less it's noticeable but like the bigger the dots or or lines the more it just starts to fuck with your your eyes it's a thing that like i've always had um and you know it was drilled into me back when i was working on the new at the news station doing visual editing so it's something that definitely jumps out to me more but i can i can tell you it's it's not something you really want at the end of the day you want your art to look as as good as it possibly can and it'd be a completely different discussion if they were printing this and, and selling it. But that the format for this, that the medium that this is being presented in is online video, I really, really think they need to, um, if at all possible, standardize to use cell shading as opposed to uh, screen tone shading. And again, I hope I'm using the right terminology there. I'm definitely not an expert on that aspect of it, but I can tell you the the screen tone or what i'm calling screen tone um does cause your tvs it does cause some tvs and computers to phase and it gets really really distracting well if you're worried about getting too technical i can kind of break that down a little bit for the layman um so anybody watching this um don't use the bad shading use the good <laughs> one use the good one thank you man us thank you're you. here to save the day no as, um, that's what i do okay did you have anything, like, uh, negatives that you wanted to talk about with this? I don't know. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I okay. enjoyed it way more than I expected. Um, nice. I thought I'd like it, maybe. But, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed the opening sequence a lot. 
Mm, that's uh, so good. Oh it's my god! Really well done. And the I did, opening in the the little uh, commercial break, man. Yeah, and I have watched uh, comic dubs uh, on YouTube from time to time. So after uh, a minute, when I realized, oh, okay, that's what we have to do with this, and, you know, it very easily uh, was quick. I was, I was very easily uh, able to get into it very quickly because uh, mm-hmm. it had the nice pacing down, even though it was mostly still shots, but some slight animation here and there. Uh, uh, you know, the effects and music worked really well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, I really love the original score that this has, that it's got its own theme, not only just as an opening theme, but it's got like the, the same... Uh, instrumental music is playing with a different tone to it for action fighting. Yeah. Uh, when you get into it, God, that's great. Um, I have no idea how he's getting away with advertising on this, but I I, like, <laughs> I applaud him. The the it's so weird the the legality that comes into like the manga stuff compared to American uh, things, but that's a completely different discussion. I suppose um, so. Um, I don't really have any like specific complaints or criticisms uh it if it was like fully animated i i would watch this this would strike me as a good dbz series or db series Mm -hmm. yeah i agree i think it's it's really really well done and you know it's such a wacky idea of a premise this character who is in like five episodes Let's make him one of the main characters for this fan series. Yeah, and it's oh, one of okay. <laughs> yeah, and it's actually one of those natural ideas that you kind of feel dumb for not thinking about it. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah. yeah, of course, Radix actually would make sense to kind of join up with these guys. Um, to the point where, like, you know, hey, why didn't Goku like at some point like wish him back? Like, especially after they got more powerful. Mm-hmm. You know, like yeah. maybe after being Super Saiyan. They go, hey, you know, why don't we give Raditz a chance? Wish him back. Like, yeah, we're, if, if he's he not goes that crazy, much... we just beat the shit out of him. You know, yeah. it's whatever. <laughs> yeah, everybody's a Super Saiyan now, so fuck it. Let's let's give him a shot. Yeah. yeah. Um, and shit, like, even Nappa. You know, it's funny, like... The he's one... got a series of what if Nappa turned good, too. Well, he, here's the thing. You know, I was thinking about this um, after I watched it. Like, yeah, Raditz killed. No chance. Uh, Nappa killed, no chance. Vegeta, easily the worst of the three. <laughs> Actually, no, I would disagree with you there, but I really don't want to get into a debate about the whole thing. No, 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 not as a character, obviously, but as a person. Like, no, actually, I would. He disagree always struck with me. You oh, really? He always struck me as the most evil of the three. Uh, I guess you know he's got he's got the most. All right, ignore the Bug Planet episode because that is just the animators filling in to give the manga time to catch up. Yeah. Um. Ignore the Bug Planet episode. Vegeta literally doesn't kill anyone. They land on Earth, and Nappa just fucking destroys a whole city for fun. Um, well, he so, kills, like, Namix. Uh Yeah, I mean, you get there. And then he way. laughs about it. Yeah, it takes time. Like, hey, but, we wish but, everybody but talking back. Of the... Hey, we, what happened to those other Namix from that village? And he's like, ha, 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 I killed them. Yep, yep. Fuck he was you, a dick there. piece no, of it... shit. He was a dick there, you, but at the you, same time, he didn't kill him for fun. Widow's peak motherfucker. <laughs> you deserve to be dead. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole fucking discussion to talk about. But no, no, no. I Actually, you, you can make an argument that that's really interesting because he is the worst of the three, so he had the longer journey to go to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, you know, these other guys didn't have a chance and nobody seems to care. Um, especially the brother. <laughs> like, you'd think, like, Goku, like, you know, hey, this is my brother. He... He had, like, uh, a bad run, and that could have well, easily like, been me. It's so funny to talk about, with, especially because this is connected tangentially to Dragon Ball Z Abridged. But, like, the first episode of Dragon Ball Z Abridged, Rabbit shows up at Kame House, and he tells Goku that he's, brother, he's his brother and blah, blah. And Krillin looks at him and goes, Wow, you're Goku's brother! I bet you're going to be really important and have long-lasting effects on the rest of the series. And Raditz just looks at him pissed off and slaps him across the fucking island. Um, yeah. And so that was, like, the joke, is Raditz is fucking pointless. Uh, and then to take him and, and turn him into uh, main characters, again, it's a really great premise. Uh, again, I just want to say this. Um, I played it in the intro. For the Thrill as an opening theme song is fucking great. Yeah. I love it. There's a... 
there's a three minute version on his channel if you want to just kind of jam out to it i love the fucking trumpet in that shit it's great so. <laughs> um all right you want to go ahead and go under ratings then yeah let's do that let's okay. do this let's do this thing all right, I'm going to go first just because I want to, uh, you know, kind of shock and, and say that I did love it to death. There is definite room for improvement, though, which I have no doubt in my mind will happen with the series as it goes along. Um, so because of that, I'm going to give it a four out of five dead brothers that nothing interesting was ever done with until now. I have been struggling for the last hour or two as, you know, I've been waiting to uh, do this recording of like, did I really have any severe issues with this outside of obviously not being uh, fully animated, which is not the fault of anybody creating. So, um, and I really couldn't find any reason to strike it down to four. So I'm going to go with a five out of five father of the year awards to Vegeta. <laughs> By saying standards, how do you know he's not? Like, really? Well, <laughs> they they I mean, send their babies off to planets, just go conquer this planet, infant child. Well, if it makes you feel any better, like Joe Jackson won, so, I mean. Oh, man. Alrighty. Um, okay, Manos, what are we going to be talking about next time? I thought it might be fun to uh, do one that just premiered like a month or two ago, and it is a Green Hornet fan film uh, nice. and i'm gonna send you the video right there uh the green hornet fan film pilot so uh i don't know too much about it but uh pilots suggest that they might want to make more which is becoming more of a thing i've noticed in fan fiction of people will like make him want to fucking series out of these things uh but hey all the power to them if they can do it so yeah i'm going to talk about green hornet sounds great sounds exciting uh all right everyone see you next time until then i'm the philosopher and i'm the realist and we are your geeky gentlemen, and we will be discussing things.